Now we're going to have a look at um, the Philippine aviation sector's role in the context of globalization. And we have another distinguished uh, speaker for you. Uh, this man has several responsibilities, and I'll summarize just a few of them for you. They were all listed in the book. Um, Dr. Victor uh, Lim Linyan is advisor to the office of the president. He's managing director at DMCI Holdings. He owns, together with his wife, Regina Capital Development Corporation and Christina Travel Corporation. He's a public policy advisor with the Asia Foundation, where amongst his great achievements, many of which there were, but one in significance today, is that he was responsible for the promotion of Clark International Airport as a hub for Asian low-cost carriers. And what a success story that is. I think we have eight budget carriers based here in Clark. So a phenomenal successful track record. Dr. Victor, please join us to talk about Philippine aviation's role in globalization. Where are you? Here. Let me master the technology first. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. But you forgot the most important qualification for my talking tonight. I'm a kapampangan. Kapampangan tamo. And I know that one of the things that I remember when when the, there was this discussion on who should be going and helping Clark, I said, my first qualification is Kapampangan because I can speak the language. No? But uh, you have to forgive me if I speak in English this morning because not all of you are Kapampangans. No? So, I'll start my talk actually by talking about another industry. Another industry. I think you're full of the uh, airline industry, but the best way, but the best way really to f understand an industry is probably to look at another industry. And this industry I talk about is the BPO. This is the one that has gotten a lot of play. Uh, there was a special report on it in December 2012 by the World Bank Group. Basically, it's saying it is in very successful. It has revenues of over 11 million. And you can see from the chart that in 2011, it has created about 640,000 direct jobs and indirect jobs of about 1.6 million. Okay. And by 2016, they think that there will be about 1.3 million jobs and about 3.2 million so forth. How did this come about? How did this uh, start from nothing? In 2004, they were exactly had zero. Okay? And the answer, and this is related to Clark, is that the business processing industry arose from, the, from one executive order issued by one president. And I'm talking about Fidel Ramos. When Fidel Ramos came in, there was only one, there was one telephone company. Okay. And if you were going to make an outside call, you would have to pay about $2 a minute. Okay. And at that time, the Philippines was struggling to have a million telephones. He came and brought this about. And the story is that it came about not because some professor from AIM or Learned talk about you must come out with a public policy. They say it arose because one of the Filipino companies made the mistake of inviting Lee Kuan Yew to talk about the, the industry in the Philippines and invited President Ramos to attend. And Lee Kuan Yew started with a joke when he said, in the Philippines, out of 100 people, 90 are still waiting for their telephone. 
nine are either not able to use the telephone because there's a party line. The young among you will not know what a party line is. You, when you know what a party line is, then you are revealing your age. <laughs> okay. Nine, they're still waiting for the party line to finish. And the one who has a connection actually has a busy signal. <laughs> actually, he was very generous. Because the num at that time, the number of telephones per 100 Filipinos is not 10, it's 1.2. Supposedly because of that, because of that, he got mad and he started and issued executive order deregulating the telecommunications industries. Take it from an old man. That is how policy is made in the Philippines. <laughs> Okay, by, by people getting mad at, at jokes which are truthful. So, I want to talk about this because I want to say that to emphasize the significance of what has happened also, what has also happened in the airline industry. The airline industry. When Ramos came up with his executive order, he never thought that he started the one major industry sector in the Philippines. All he wanted to do was to remove the sting of the joke of Lee Kuan Yew. And look what we have now. Okay? Clark started because Mr. Angeles had the brilliant idea to name it the Diosdado Makapagal International Airport. And because of that, we were able to work out a lot of the liberalization policies of the administration. But enough, enough of this talk about the past. Memories are good for us old people. But as Bill Clinton said, when your memories are greater than your dreams, then you are old. I do not wish to be old. And so, the rest of my talk will be about the dreams, the dreams that I have for Clark as a true Kapampangan. And this dream will be based initially on reality. Clark, I'll talk about, is a strategic gateway. This is the reality that we have. This has always been of interest to a lot of people. No? That's why we have the, started as a military base, because it's, the, again, the gateway to the Far East in respect to the military issues. No? Now, it is the gate of the, it is the gateway, and I'll show the map later, of the gateway from North America to Southeast Asia. Okay, location, location. We have to remember this again. The reason why Thailand became a tourist destination is because it was the gateway to Southeast Asia from Europe. And I've always wondered, why is it that Thailand developed initially as a gateway to South Asia for Europeans? Why is it that the Philippines did not become a gateway, a gateway to Southeast Asia for North America? Why was its place taken by Korea, Japan, Narita? If you're going to Southeast Asia, your gateway is actually further up north. The nearest you would have would be Hong Kong and Taipei. Of course, really, Hong Kong is being the gateway. And that has always been puzzling me on why we have not been the gateway. But again, uh, it is not too late because we have, we are in the right location. That is the reality that we are starting with. I will talk about three dreams that I have for Clark. The first one, of course, is Clark as a logistics hub. And that is actually starting now. That is the dream that is closer to reality. I would like to talk about Clark as a stimulus for agricultural export. I will explain later. People cannot understand what's the connection of, of, of airline 
of airline to agriculture, okay? And I'm so happy that there was the only agricultural secretary who understood the connection was Secretary Alcala because he came out in favor of open skies. He was one of the strong supporters of open skies. And when people ask me, why would an agriculture secretary be for open sky? I said, I will explain later on why this is so. Clark could also be a staging area for highly skilled prof professionals. And Clark, for me, could be the birthplace of a Filipino global trading company. So, just the map will show, as I said, that the Philippines has the potential to be the gateway uh, to Southeast Asia. But right now, as I say, the gateway has been Japan, Korea, and Hong Kong. No? This is how it shows that from here it would go here. And you can see that Thailand is the gateway from Europe. Okay. Singapore is not the gateway. It became the hub for Southeast Asia or ASEAN because from Singapore, you could go to Manila, to Indonesia, and so forth. So one of the things that we understand about airline is really uh, the location is very important, uh, like in real estate. No matter what New Zealand does or what Australia does, they cannot be a hub because they're at the bottom of the world, no? So Clark has been transformed, as uh, we can see, I'm just mentioning it. One of the things that, that I've been talking about is, unlike Cebu, our interna Clark is little international airport, and the domestic is little, but it's actually improving. I'm beginning to think that as the international comes in, it can become also the gateway to the rest of the Philippines. In other words, uh, if you are from, from Korea, you fly to Clark, and then from Clark, you could go to Boracay or the other areas. Those are the realities, but I would like to emphasize more of the dreams. Ah, this already, this place. Okay. Why is Clark going to be a stimulus for agriculture? You know, one of the things that we always hear is this, that how come the Philippine agriculture lags to Thailand when the Thais send their people to be trained at Los Baños? Okay, and this is really what hurts Los Baños professors. Okay, as a fellow professor, I sympathize with them because then people are saying the reason why they're more successful is because we all know that students always outdo their teachers. I do not accept that, okay? The reason why Thailand did better is very simple. By that, at that time, Thailand had 12 million tourists. We had 1 million tourists. Now, in essence, tourism is what is called by economists arbitraging. Meaning that if I were in Europe, I could not get a maid because it's expensive. <laughs> I could not have somebody make my med because it's expensive, but I will therefore go to a place where this is cheap. Okay? But I also want what I am getting in Europe. I want the good food, the good quality of everything, and so forth. So the key here is I'm willing to pay. I'm willing to pay. Thai agriculture developed because there were 12 million people who were pay, willing to pay for good Thai rice, for good Thai fruits, for good Thai vegetables and everything. In the Philippines, there were only one. There was only a market. People always look at the production, not at the market. In fact, the one area, very few people know, the one area where we were successful in agriculture was because of Clark. I think very few know the story. If you look at what is the modern agricultural product in the Philippines, it is sweet corn. Right? Again, for us old, 
We used our corn before was the hybrid corn. Small one, not very delicious, not very sweet. Why did we have sweet corn? Because in the 1960s, Clark was used as a base for the military of the U.S. And the military wanted to feed their soldiers what they were feeding them at home. And one of the ingredients is sweet corn. And they couldn't find the corn in the Philippines. So what did they do? They talked to some businessmen and say, why don't you plant sweet corn? And the businessman says, I will do it if you will buy this and you will pay me this price. And said, no problem. That is why, that is why the industry, the agricultural industry and the sweet corn has developed. People think of production. They should be thinking about the market. Another illustration is that there was a one time, this is the problem of being old, huh? so many memories. <laughs> uh, there was one time that the in thing in agriculture was to adapt Israeli agriculture because it was very successful and so forth. And they even have a technology called drip technology where you put in expensive pipes and then you put some, uh, some drill some hole and then it feeds water into the plant. Of course, it's the wrong technology. <laughs> they were growing fruits in the desert and therefore they had to conserve water. In the Philippines, our problem is too much water. <laughs> okay? Why was Israeli agriculture successful? It was because Israel was exporting to Europe. 66% of their agriculture is exported to Europe. Why? Because they could grow vegetables and fruits during the winter months in Europe when they couldn't, when the Europeans could not produce fresh fruits because of the winter months. Here we are, we are a tropical country. There's Japan, there's Korea. I understand in Korea they still have winter. Why aren't we producing the fruits and the vegetables that they need. And that's happening now. We can do it now because of the fact that Clark exists. Okay. Okra used to be grown in, the, in Mindanao. Okay. But it's very difficult because okra has to be cut at a certain, at a certain length. You ship it from Mindanao to Manila, from Manila to Japan. Here, our farmers, our okra farmers can, can actually harvest the crop in three hours and then ship it to Japan. So, for, for us, actually, agriculture in Pampanga is going to be developed. But people are saying, yeah, but the soil is more fertile in Mindanao. Why, why in Mindanao and not here? It's very simple. It's a term in transportation called backhaul. I was talking to somebody who was going to put up operations. He said, why not General Santos? They have a nice airport. Yeah, the problem with General Santos is we get the tuna, we ship it, and then the airplanes come back empty. And therefore, our, our transport cost is difficult. In Clark, you could export agricultural product, and you could bring back the components for computers to be assembled and so forth. Again, the dream that we have as Clark as an agricultural area, as an agricultural uh, uh, export processing zone has validity, okay? Not, not because it has better climate, no? but because of the fact that it has both traffic, one way one way to Japan, let's say, and one way from, from Japan. This is it. So, the dream is that Filipino producers could serve the high value requirements of China, Japan, Korea during the, during the winter months. I understand the Koreans are here and are already growing shrimps and so forth. Why? Again, it is really to take advantage of the climate difference. We're only about four hours away from them, but that four hours is a difference between winter and summer in the Philippines. No. 
Next. Clark as a staging area for highly skilled professionals. Okay. Initially, we actually <laughs> became a source. I remember one Holy Week when I decided that instead of staying in the Philippines because everybody's crowded, I would go to an area where there are no Catholic practices. <laughs> and that is Macau. So we took my wife and we went to Macau and it was no problem. And, and I was so happy because when I went to them, all the Filipinos that were with me were speaking in Kapampangan. But I could understand what they were saying. So they were talking. They were actually car dealers. Car dealers in the casino in Angeles. And they were being pirated. And they were so excited because they said, well, we're going to Macau. We're going to be dealers there. Okay, the, the flights are so cheap that we could go home every weekend to our families. <laughs> okay, and that we are getting a, a very big pay. So, Clark could be a staging area for a lot of professionals. I'll give you an example. These are the new international players that we have. And therefore, what this means is they can bring in the tourists, but they can bring out our professionals. Okay. This is a very specific example. I'm with DMCI. Okay. We, are, we have started constructing power plants. Uh, uh, and our, our view is that, is that in order to run the power plant, we must start coming out with studying the, the power plant and then developing a core of engineers who will maintain it. Toshiba goes to us and said, you know, we have, se we have several power plants all over the world. Okay? We want to maintain them. Okay? But our main concept of maintenance is not just maintenance. Our concept is for the, for the, for the maintenance, which is low key, low, low skill, we will do that with the locals. But if there's a big problem, we want to fly in the troubleshooters. So basically, it's like a SWAT team. You schedule them, you, stay, you, 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 you base them in, the, in Clark, and then if there's a problem, let's say, in, in Nairobi, then you can fly them to do that. So they said, why don't you consider that? And of course, we're considering it, but really, we're not in that business. But, but this is an idea for some people to say, look, we could put up a group of highly skilled professionals, the highest that we have. It's actually being done now in another profession. Most of the regional companies, actually, their accounting is done here, and that is also the, the ordinary work. But more importantly, the auditing is done here. When there is a special audit for a company, let's say in Thailand, the one who conducts the auditor is an auditor, a Filipino auditor, who flies from Manila, takes a look at that, and tries to solve it. So, we can go up the value chain, okay? Why? Because what we can do is use the professionals to be able to fly them at a moment's notice. Because you have to understand that, in a sense, BPO and, in, and the transportation industry are related, okay? FedEx is having difficulties. Why? Because when you used to sell, send document, now you can send them by, by email. You just scan the document and you, and you scan them. So we are in a sweet spot. Okay? Our BPO will focus on, tran on things that can be transported electronically. And hopefully, Clark can be used to transport people physically to areas where it still has to be done. This gives you an idea of how many of the firms are considering offshoring. No? Okay. IT, contact center is there, of course, marketing, and so forth. No? So 
in tandem with BPO, what we could probably do is do year what can be done year and then send the expert to go there to the, to the place when there is something to be done. Example again is investment banking. Okay? Commercial banking, it can be done, but if you want to send an investment banker to convince people to do that, then you can base your investment banker here. The key to that, of course, is that he can fly at a moment's notice to go anywhere. No? Lastly, lastly, I want to talk about a Filipino global company. The idea there is little Dutch India company. So one of the things that we are looking for is we don't have a Filipino global company, probably with the exception of ICTS. As you know, ICTS operates in different ports. So it's very interesting always to look at how people started. So one time we had as guest speaker a certain person by the name of Stan Shi. Stan Shi is a Taiwanese. He was the founder of Acer, which is one of the top computer company. And I said, how did you start into this computer? He said, it's very simple. Uh, I graduated as an engineer. I came from, a, from the best engineering school in Taiwan. We graduated, and after we graduated, we started working in different, different factories. At that time, the main contribution of Taiwan was that they were making the components. They were making the components for the personal computers. Okay. For example, in the case of IBM, in the case of IBM, as mentioned uh, by our guest speaker about the I, about the iPhone, the components were subcontracted to the different factories in Taiwan at that time. And then what you did is you shipped the components, and then you assembled them, and you have a PC, uh, the first IBM PC. You would sell it for a thousand, but but it would cost probably only about uh, 200 in terms of components. So he said, one day we had this school reunion, and we started talking about what we're doing. And at a certain point, we realized that we were all with companies producing different parts <laughs> of the IBM computer. And it came up with a bright idea, why don't we get together and put it up? And that's how Acer started, a group of classmates who used to work, who were working for different factories producing different components of IBM. Is there a difference? He said, no, the only difference is we remove the, the IBM seal and we just put Acer. That's the only difference between IBM computer and us. So my dream is that as, as Clark becomes a, a logistics hub, there will be some bright people among you who will start noticing that parts are coming, the cheapest parts are coming, and then we'll assemble something and, and do something about it. It's not far-fetched. Do you know that the Aboitis company, how it started? It was started 150 years ago by somebody who was running several ships. He, he was running uh, what they call transit, wherein you transport commodities from one island in the Visayas. And of course, the, the hub at that time, there were no airplanes. The hub at that time, of course, was in Cebu. So the, he would have a, a fleet of vessels who would be going to Samar, to Bohol, and so forth. Okay, what distinguished him was that every time the, the captain would go to the home port, he would be interviewed by the owner. <laughs> and the owner, um, I, don't, I forgot the, the first name, but Mr. Aboitis would ask, oh, what is the price of rice here? What is the price of sugar? Where, what the, are you bringing to this area? And so forth. Because he realized that what is more important than the cargo that is being carried 
is the information that is embedded into this operation. And how did he make his money? He found out that there's a price differential of sugar, let's say, in summer versus sugar in Negros, and all he had to do that. And there were even times because what he did was that he had the boats. If the boats were not full with the cargo of others, that is when he loaded his own sugar to be traded. And therefore, his transportation cost, as economists will tell you, is really zero because of the empty bulkhead. So that, that's what I'm saying is the role of, of, of the airport, of, of, of aviation to, to, the, to the world. That we hope that there is somebody from among these who will be the future avoidance. Looking, looking at the information that is embedded in the logistics that we are carrying. That, that he will start making sense of what is, uh, what is going on. So, these are the dreams uh, that I would like to have. Unfortunately, I'm too old to carry those dreams. That's why I'm looking at the young people out there in order to be able to carry on these dreams. You are going to live in a far, far better world than us. And the only thing that we want to, to say is that we wish you the best of luck. Thank you.